Exchange of these gases in the soil, between the soil air and the air above the soil, is a very, very important process. We need to have free diffusion or movement of gases between the air above and the air within the soil. Anything that restricts that movement is going to cause a buildup of CO2 in the soil at the expense of oxygen, since we have many things utilizing oxygen in the soil and releasing CO2 as a result of those processes, primarily respiration of, of living organisms. What types of things could cause a restriction in this free exchange of oxygen? Well, one of the things certainly would be any type of a crusting or undesirable type of, of structure at the surface of the soil. That would restrict or slow down this exchange of oxygen. The other thing that we oftentimes find restricting this exchange of oxygen and, and causing reduced growth of plants as a result of that is, it is water logging. If the pore spaces are too full of water, there's simply not enough room for the gases and the exchange of gases with the air above is much slower. And this can lead to uh, poor growth of plants due to a restricted oxygen supply to the root system of those plants. So although we think in most cases it's the more water the better when it comes to the soil, we can certainly overdo it too. We can have oxygen contents too low don't support good root respiration, don't support good micro, soil microorganism activity, and this, this has a tendency to lead to uh, non-productive soils for physical reasons, not really chemical reasons. Now, I indicated earlier, I said if we use these numbers of 50% solids and, and 50% pore space and then look how they're broken down, uh, that's an average mineral soil, meaning one that's, that's medium textural class soil. On this next graphic that I'm illustrating at this point in time, it's comparing two soils. And of course, if we're going to compare these soils, we need to compare them at what's called field capacity. In other words, they have to be at a comparable moisture content. So these two soils are, field, are compared to each other at field capacity, and we're comparing a medium textured soil, a silt loam, with a coarse textured soil, a sandy loam. Now the silt loam soil, being medium and textural class, fits our description very well of the average mineral soil. We see that there's approximately 45% mineral matter, 5% organic material, and the remaining 50% pore space is divided not exactly equally, but about 30% water and about 20% uh, soil atmosphere or soil air. So here we still have the 50% pore space, 50% solid relationship. The solids, the mineral and organic fraction, don't really change very much. But of course, the atmosphere, or, or excuse me, the soil pore spaces, we have 30% water and 20% versus before we just showed a, a percentage of 25% for air and 25% for water. Now, how does this change as we go into a coarser textured soil? Well. Also illustrated on your graphic at this point in time is a sandy loam soil. The first thing that is obvious here is that the solid portion of the soil is more than 50% of the total soil volume. The mineral matter alone in a sandy loam soil would be somewhere around 57%. And we would expect, as I mentioned earlier, in coarse textured soils, that organic content would likely be lower. So here we're illustrating it at 1%. But now we have the solid portion of the soil occupying the 57 plus the 1, or a total of 58%. So when we go from a medium to a coarser textured soil, the percentage of the soil's volume occupied by solids will increase. Which if we increase the solid portion, that must mean that we have to decrease the pore space. This may be very contradictory to what you would have believed, in that we think of coarse soils as being very porous, meaning that they have very large pores. That is indeed true. But here we're not focusing on individual pore size, but we're looking at the total volume of pores within a given volume of soil. So when we have 57% mineral matter and 1% organic matter, that only leaves a total of 42% for the pore space. Now obviously, if we're comparing these two soils at field capacity, or if we were going to see which of these two soils were heavier, we would do that on a dry weight basis. Well, of course, the sandy loam soil with 50% mineral matter, 57% mineral matter, where compared to 45% in the, in the silt loam, would be much heavier. And indeed, 
as we'll see in a later unit, coarse soils, as we increase the texture, the size of the particles, we do actually get heavier soils, those that weigh more per unit volume. So we've got air and water in the remaining 42% of that pore space, and as you would expect at field capacity, we're holding a much lower volume of soil water. These large pore spaces do not retain water to near as highly a percentage of their, of their total pore volume as do smaller pores typical that are found in the silt loam. So here we see that sandy soils, coarse textured soils, have a greater percent of volume occupied by mineral matter, a lesser percent of organic matter. They definitely hold less water per unit volume, and the airspace relationships are, are somewhat comparable. This causes these soils to be heavier, and here again we run into a common misnomer. People often call finer textured soils, those higher in clay, heavy soils. But as, we, as you would get from this graphic, and as we'll talk about more later on and prove to ourselves in the laboratory, that is not actually true. The, as the texture gets coarser, the soil gets heavier. So well then, why do we call a clay soil a heavy soil? These are called heavy soils because of the ease, or in this case, the lack of ease with which they work, which with which they will be cultivated or physically manipulated. Being higher in clay content, being a finer textured soil, these soils are more difficult to work with, or the ease with which they work or cultivate is, is more difficult. And that is where the term heavy soil comes from when, we're, when we are referring to a clay textural class soil. These four components of the soil that we just talked about fit into what are referred to in your textbook as the three phases of the soil. Now I think this is probably fairly obvious, but the mineral component and the organic component each or together form the solid phase of the soils. The other two components, the liquid phase, which we refer to as soil solution, and the gaseous phase, which we refer to as a soil atmosphere and looked at those three major gases that are, that are the components within the soil atmosphere. 